important element of progress. Acting in secret and without proper accountability, and because they always get things wrong, we can reliably expect that there are going to be more scandals come out of this. Hello and welcome to Evening Report. Hamet Sudan is currently in Iraqi Kurdistan where he has been working with Christian peacemaker teams investigating allegations of rising tensions in internally displaced camps and reporting those findings to United Nations organisations that are operating in the region. And we talked to Hamet Sudan tonight before he leaves Iraq to return to New Zealand. A welcome to Evening Report, Hamet Sudan. Hi, someone. Uh, Hamid, as I understand it, um, you've been taking part in an investigation into allegations of widespread discrimination in um, displaced persons camps in the Kurdistan region. Can you tell me about um, that investigation, please? Um, so just to recap, um, what happened was an aid worker working for an organization, a service provider in the camp, uh, approached our organization, CPT, um, with allegations of communal tension, specifically ethno-religious discrimination. Um, and so as a result, CPT started to conduct an investigation. Um, so that investigation now is concluded and we've moved on to the next phase, which is to uh, discuss our findings with um, UNHCR that are a major organization responsible for um, issues like this relating to the camp and UNDP as well. So CPT is actually part of a, it's called a social cohesion cluster, which is a group of NGOs coordinated by UNDP, um, basically dealing with uh, issues of social cohesion and um, there's another cluster for protection as well that CPT is part of. So we've basically been um, discussing our findings in detail with UNHCR. Um, what we found is quite sensitive. Uh, the concern is that it, uh, publicizing this information might exacerbate uh, existing communal tensions, not just in the camps, but also in Kurdistan, because uh, things are very tense as a result of the economic and uh, security situation here as a result of the conflict. So, so when you say that there are sensitivities about publishing or drawing attention to uh, the, the, the discrimination, what exactly do you mean there? Is that something that you cannot talk about or that it is actually a, something that can be progressed toward a more satisfactory situation if you do? I think at this stage the um, findings need to be discussed with UNHCR and we need to formulate a strategy on um, how to deal with the issue. Mm. Um, I understand from your, um, you issued a press statement uh, earlier uh, on, on the 1st of uh, June um, where you're referring to such things in the past tense that your team met with representatives of UNHCR and UNDP and what was the outcome of that meeting? So again I can't discuss the findings uh, publicly. Um, the NGOs need to come together and formulate a plan. Um, as I've said, that the risk is of exacerbating uh, pre already existing tensions in the region. It's a very serious issue, so it's so not in, something that, that can be yes, I understand that. In, discussed in, in detail. In your, in your press statement, you also say that you are extremely concerned that the communal tensions in the camp could turn into communal violence. Um, once again, you're alluding to some very serious things and you're actually um, stimulating, if you like, attention to those in the public arena. What, what is your desirable outcome um, by doing so? Um, it's widely known that they're here anyway, that that's a serious situation. Um, it may not be known outside that conflict can actually um, exacerbate tensions between different groups. Mm. And th th those, those, um, th those tensions, if you like, what do you see at this stage, at this juncture, uh, are the solutions to these tensions? Let's put it that way. 
So again, that's part of the findings and that needs to be discussed with the agencies responsible for uh, running the camp or uh, that have authority in that area. Okay, um, you, you make mention also in your statement that the US-led coalition's military operations are adding to an already high number of civilians killed or displaced. Can you talk about that? Well, I mean, that's information coming from major aid, major aid agencies. Uh, with, so there are two components. One is the humanitarian situation. The other one is the security situation. So according to major aid agencies, that the um, strategy of the U.S.-led coalition um, and also the uh, shortage of funding uh, compounding the humanitarian crisis. Um, in re with regards to the security situation, uh, human rights organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, again, uh, have implicated uh, coalition partners in uh, human rights abuses that may constitute war crimes. So these two things are effectively uh, you could say putting pressure, uh, creating more internally displaced people, which is putting a lot of pressure on an already overstretched, um, and the aid agencies dealing with IDPs are already overstretched. Um, so to give you an example, uh, the IDP camp where we've been working, uh, oh, this is not my area obviously, but uh, this is information from another NGO, uh, that effectively discusses uh, issues with IDPs, what they're lacking, and so on and so forth. And this is from mid-May. Um, so one major area that was identified as lacking uh, was the lack of water. And so that's uh, resulting in skin diseases of various types. Um, another issue, uh, this, so these are health-related issues. Another issue is um, the hospital can only receive a certain number of people a day, which is, uh, they'd like that to increase. It, here it says 20 people per day, which is not much for a camp that has 17,000 people. Mm. Mm. Um, they need insecticide because scorpions and snakes at this time of year. Mm. Um, and that's especially dangerous for children. Um, another issue, so again, lack of water is identified, um, sanitation, it's causing problems, pollution, and so forth. Um, they're saying that lack of water is causing a lot of domestic tension within families. Um, for, there's a shortage of fire extinguishers. Uh, unfortunately, a four-year-old um, was burned to death in a tent fire because the fire extinguisher had expired. Mm. So all of these uh, things it just goes on. Do, do they um, do they reflect uh, your own observations as you've been around the areas, as you've been around the camps that you've been um, focusing on? Uh, is that that report that you've been citing there? Is that something that you notice um, as you walk around? Um, so what I've seen is I've seen the uh, sanitation problems. I've seen the problems of large areas not having electricity. Um, so those two things I've personally observed. Yeah, and and, what, and the high tent density as well in some areas um, because people just keep coming in. Yes. So. yes. And and so, what are the possible solutions in your view um, to this particular? This major problem, obviously, from a humanitarian point of view, what what are the major solution? What are the solutions that you see that are possible here? Well, one solution, which dealing with just the humanitarian aspects, not discussing the communal tensions, mm. but this would obviously help. Would be uh, just a huge an injection of money. There's a shortage of money. It's as simple as that. And who, who would be the recipient of that money, and where would the money be sourced from, do you believe? It would be sourced from uh, countries, and it would be provided to the UN, specific, various UN agencies. 
and then distributed through the UN um, uh, networks and procurement programs, et cetera, et cetera, I would exactly. imagine. Now, with, with New Zealand's role, um, and you've been critical, obviously, when you were back here in New Zealand, of New Zealand choosing to actually deploy and be part of the US-led coalition um, to the conflict between ISIS and other forces in the Iraq, Syria um, region. Now, after, now you've been there for some weeks over in, in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, how, how do you sum up your position now? Um, and even if there is a comparison to prior to you leaving New Zealand? Um, I think it just reinf what I've se personally seen is just, uh, it just reinforces my previous position effectively. And, and what, what, so. what is that? Like, um, just for example, I'm reading from your statement here and um, you make reference to that um, as a responsible international citizen and member of the United Nations Security Council, New Zealand should work independently of the US coalition and push for a UN mandated mission. Now, can you just explain what you mean by that, the UN mandated mission perhaps? Um, well, it, the UN Security Council should decide what measures um, nations should take to address the ISIS threat, not the United States. Mm. That, that's all that means. So you, you, you are advocating bringing a legitimacy perhaps to an international force as opposed to um, United States-led interests um, pulling together this coalition. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but to summarise, is that an accurate assessment? Yes, so it would mean that uh, more countries will be involved in um, in resolving the issue. Uh, the assumption is that it would be more likely to lead to something that uh, serves the interests of the people in the region. Yes, um, and now you're also preparing to return um, from Kurdistan, Iraq, to New Zealand. Um, what, what's your intended m uh, message uh, that you would like to deliver back to New Zealanders here in once you return here? Well, you just said it, <laughs> which is just, um, you know, that New Zealand's uh, foreign policy affects a lot of people all over the world, and we should ensure as New Zealanders that uh, that policy should reflect our values, which it uh, on many occasions does not, as in this case. And um, to the uh, Iraqi and Kurdistan uh, communities back in New Zealand, is there a message specifically for them that you'd like to convey as well? Um, well, it's been an honour being in Kurdistan. Um, it's a place I like very much. And I hope to see um, stability and peace in this region soon. Um, Hamid, thank you very much for uh, once again taking part in these um, these brief interviews um, and certainly it's a, an absolute privilege to be able to cross from New Zealand to you live and discuss these things uh, as, as you were uh, over there and contemplating really the situation that so many thousands of people are finding themselves in. So, and also congratulations to you too um, for, for actually walking the walk and not just um, sitting back in New Zealand perhaps and, and saying how things should be, you've actually gone and done something as well. Congratulations on it. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.